heavy metal perspective. From Danzig to Death, to Dark Throne to Dr. Shrinker. Buckle up, things are about to get heavy. This is the Metal Podcast. Let's rock and roll. And welcome to the Metal Podcast, the show that keeps on going. We got an explosive episode, and we're going to have a lot of fun. I am, of course, DJ, and here with me, as always, AC, the man without a face. How are you doing today? Um, I'm very good. Actually, that song, Eyes Without a Face, was oh, written yes. about me. It was. <laughs> good point. And we have a special guest with us, the the amazing, talented Vince Welsh. How are you doing today, sir? I am very good, DJ. It's really great to be here. I really love your podcast. I'm looking forward to a great episode. Oh, well, thank you. And appreciate those kind words. And we're excited as well. And, you know, um, what have you been listening to? Up, 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 up. DJ, come on. What? How do we now start the show? I know it's only been a few weeks, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. I, I messed. I messed up our own thing. Okay. Uh, so we're doing songs of the week. Oh, cool. Um, so, so, um, I guess AC, you can go first and it's a, a song that you think th- it doesn't get enough recognition or, or, you know, maybe it, like, don't pick like, uh, don't pick stairway to heaven. Yeah. Or like how would be thy name from Iron Maiden. It's right. something like last week I did, uh, the loneliness of the long distance runner. So I guess AC, what, what's your song? So my song this week is what if God's not one of us by fear from the 2000 classic American beer. Okay. It's I a, don't think I've heard that one. Well, it's a, it's a very good song and it's oh. kind of uh the inverse of what if God is God one of us. One of us. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, it's a, has really cool guitar playing in it and Lee Ving's really good singer. And uh-huh. the, the idea is actually, it's, it's kind of clever and it's very postmodern, especially the era it came out. Cause it was, it was it, the album was 2000 and the world really did change in 2001 like just everyone's outlook on everything and their attitude so it it's it's a it's a very interesting uh, moment in time for that song to be released okay i like Derf good- scratch great guitar player i don't think he was on that album though what yeah no uh, that's a shame yeah so i guess my my song kind of goes in line with, with your, your theme there. I'm going to pick World War by Icon. It's actually my favorite Icon song, even though it's not off my favorite Icon album. Like mm. Night of the Crime is my favorite, but World War Icon. It's very, very catchy lyrics, cool guitar playing, and just just flat out awesome. So that is that is my yeah. choice. AC Silence seems like he's he likes it. So... Vince, I know you're you're kind of put on the spot. Um, is there is there a song that you think deserves more recognition or something you like that's you know doesn't doesn't get get what uh, you know it deserves? So we can interpret whenever AC emits silence, we can interpret that as an endorsement for whatever we say. That's good. To know. So if he's <laughs> yeah. quiet, then we're then we know we're we're, we're on point here. Exactly. All right, I'm going to go with a song called "Black Waterside" by an English folk guitarist of the '60s named Burke Janch. I mean he. He went beyond the 60s, but he made his name in the 60s uh, in the the English folk revival of the late 60s and early 70s. He was one of the founders of the band Pentangle and Black Waterside was a direct inspiration for Jimmy Page, who did uh, was it White Mountainside? What is it? What's what's the acoustic track on Led Zeppelin one? It's White Mountainside. I'm going to I should know this. I have no yeah, idea. I think it's called White. It's, it's no White Mountainside was maybe what he did with the with the Yardbirds. Then he did. Uh, it's the one that leads right into Communication Breakdown. Anyway, Jimmy kind of it was inspired directly by the Burt Janch melody for that track. It's, so you can hear a lot of that. It's Black Mountainside. Thank you very much, Black Mountainside. So it was an inspiration for Black Mountainside, and you can hear you can hear those sort of the sort of alternate tunings that Jimmy Page became known for as well as the great finger picking. So I, it was on my show this week, so I played it. So it's been sort of stuck in my craw ever since. There I, it is. It, it's finger picking think, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think anyone would deny that that's a, a little under the radar pick. Any, any pick that isn't, 
Inter Sandman is a good pick, generally. <laughs> that was not going to be my second choice, so I think we're okay there. Okay, okay. Yeah, I got to change mine up for next week then. Right. I have to give you a heads up because I know you've been going on about how much you love that song. No, yes. You just heard it for the first time. You, DJ went to his first baseball game, so he got to hear Inter Sandman. Who did you yep. see? Or, or is that no? Or is that not true? Yeah, was, not just go to your first. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. not true. I was yeah. making the joke that they play that at every baseball game. You got me. All right, you got me. <laughs> I've been got that and Crazy Train. If you go to a baseball game, those are two songs you will hear. Crazy Train. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So Vince, what uh, show do you have? I do a weekly radio show. I'm now on a college station, Valencia College Radio, which is a local college here in the greater Orlando area. I started out on AM. It's called Electric Vinny Land, which is a corny takeoff on my name. And it's basically a free form. It's basically a free form classic rock show, something like Jim Ladd used to do in LA and then on Sirius XM. But my net that I cast is a little bit wider and I am likely to include some jazz, some blues, a little bit of country, um, really you name it. So I tend to create shows that are thematically linked and I try to illustrate various connective tissues between various strains of music, like in simple terms, like, okay, here's this blues song and let's play some heavy metal next to it. So you can extrapolate and go, Oh my gosh, the blues was a direct influence on heavy metal. Obviously it's not that simplistic, but that's the idea. Okay. And uh, you play uh newer country, like, you know, like you, are you going to play Beyonce's country album or uh, no. what, who, who's that fat uh, jelly roll? A jelly roll. No, I'm not into any of that stuff. My my stuff tends to be a little bit more um, rooted in the classics. My rock and roll tastes lean that way too, but my country is more uh, more of a honky tonk country guy, uh, and I will follow any new country that has sort of evolved from that. So so the newer artists that I like are more on the edge. I'm not like a mainstream country guy. If that's probably too long of an answer for your question, but there it is. No, no, that, that was perfect because it like this newer country like. Beyonce Jelly Roll. Okay, the I think the number one song right now, or at least maybe it's country, is Shabuzi Tipsy. Have you heard that one? Everyone in the, the bar getting it's tipsy. Good, and, yeah. It's like it's like total hip hop, but it has who who does like, it? Like the Shabuzi. Is that oh that's that's the name of the artist? I thought that was that's part like, of yeah. the song. <laughs> no, it's his his name or whatever. And it's how called sp- Tipsy. How do you spell that? It's like S H. A B O O E Z Y. I think there's an I somewhere in there, but that'll that'll generate some results if you look that up. But yeah, and it's it is so terrible. It's horrible. But it, they try to make it like it's this is country. It uh, it just drives me nuts. It's just Tom Petty rapper. gave an interview last year or so of his life. He gave an interview, and I forget who he was talking to, but he made a comment about new country basically being bad rock with fiddles. Okay, and it's a little different than a Beyonce track, but I. You know, for the most part, I tend to agree. It's just a bunch of watered down pop gook. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I I saw an interview with Rob Zombie. I want to say in the maybe the earlier mid 2000s. And they were just some generic stuff like, tell me about your influences. And he brought up country. And then they they Mm. started naming like contemporary country artists. And he said, no, that's just pop for rednecks. And, and and that was that you know that was twenty years ago and it it's only gotten worse I, and it it's no longer pop for rednecks it's it's basically just for the same people that like rap it's it's not even for I know there are more rural people that still like that stuff but I think sure. I I want to say like country fashion is, is it's like a trend, like urbanites wearing like, okay. Do yeah, you might remember this, but when, when urban cowboy came out, <laughs> like people started wearing jeans and cowboy boots, just like for, for yeah. fashion. And that's almost had a new resurgence where people are kind of LARPing as blue collar. Like they're not actually like blue collar people, but, uh, like not too far from where I live there, there's, like a quote unquote country bar. And it's, you know, I'm not in the country. And and then there's all these people here with, with mullets that I'm sure they paid a hairdresser $150 <laughs> to have like perfectly done. Oh. 
and they they have their expensive glasses and, and uh, designer jeans and really expensive cowboy boots. Like you are so far from blue collar, and and that is something that I've really noticed that this new country it's it's not pop for rednecks. It, it's pop for urbanites that wish they were blue collar. It's very, very strange phenomenon. <laughs> well, no, I think you have an excellent point there. And I think you can go all the way back on that. So antecedents to me, starting, you know, if you want to just take the rock and roll era, starting in the 50s and, and even into the folk movement of the early 60s, people gravitating towards, say, folk's a good example. So people gravitating towards songs about uh, Dust Bowl farmers or Kentucky coal miners. And these are like, sort of like middle-class American college students embracing the the look and the content of those songs. And it's, yeah, it's like a sort of, I mean, cultural appropriation is way too harsh of a term here, but it is a form of trying to identify with something that you, you know, that you label as genuine, like some sort of genuine roots. And then you, you go out of your way to kind of emulate it. It's interesting. And yeah, Urban Cowboy was, was a great, I was going to say modern example, but that's ancient at this point. 40, to me, that's Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks in the early '90s broke that. Let's make let's make a a form of country music, a country pop, rock influenced country music. Let's make that mainstream popular, and I I think it's been building ever since, based on the the work that he did. Well, but I'm going to no. I'm going to pull into my my old uh, outdated uh, lingo bag, and I'm going to pull out a, a word that no one really uses anymore, but uh, they used to. Yeah, the word you're looking for is poser, but well, no one no yeah. one <laughs> no one calls anyone a poser anymore. It's almost like it's like Latin. It's like part of a dead language because <laughs> because before there used to be social cliques and like, you know, the metal, the punk or whatever, but now people are pretending to be like ruralites and that it's, and it's, you know, you would have to have real ruralites coming up to them and saying, you know, you, you poser, but one, they probably don't care. And two, they're probably not even wise to it because you see these people. And then if you're not actually taking the time to scrutinize, yeah, they'll blend hmm. in, but I, I see it. And I go, okay, considering where we are, you shouldn't be dressed like that. And then I look even further and I'm like, okay, you are, you are trying really hard to look a certain part in a way where it's like too perfect. So something is wrong. And then like, okay, yeah, you're not from here. This isn't actual music that you like. You just wish this were you because this is a trend now. You're doing it for fashion because it's what's popular. And that's what the urbanite has always kind of been. It's just. That's an interesting observation. It reminds me of something that we were commenting on earlier about Metallica and about that audience being sort of a mainstream pop audience that embraced that sort of nerf metal thing that metallic is doing and i you know i think if you go back in heavy metal back to the late 60s and early 70s there was a real blue collar ethic just embedded into heavy metal as a subgenre it was a group of people that responded to that and i'm not telling you something you don't know here but to my mind that group of people shared that ethos like they were a subset of rock fans a lot of them were blue collar and a lot of the values that one associated with metal back in those days, very similar to country music values in a way, classic country. So it's very working class and there was a pretty well-defined moral code. And I think, as you have said more eloquently than I have here, I think a lot of that's been lost as a lot of this music becomes just this sort of mainstream product with you know mine and missing its roots it's like you pull it up from its roots you throw it in the mainstream and then yeah you're going to get a bunch of posers who are just wearing it as a fashion and maybe we, that's overstated i don't know but anyway you know, i think it, it's I, it's probably just over emphasizing it but yeah that, that's not really overstating but you do not get more blue collar than black sabbath like their roots yes. like they they were like the quintessential blue collar band 
I mean, so they are so blue collar that Tony Iommi's job <laughs> oh, forced their saw or forced their sound. Oh, with the finger or something? Was yeah, it, yeah, cu- cutting his uh, his fingertips off, so he <laughs> couldn't. He had to wear rubber caps and loosen the tension on his guitar, and, and it just Unbelievable. they accidentally came up with that sound. Like Black Sabbath wasn't, they weren't sitting around like, Hey, let's do something different. Like what if we like tuned way down and then we just had like a really dark sound because the only real dark song from, from Black Sabbath is Black Sabbath. Like every, everything right. else, like, like, you know, I guess you could say Iron Man, just the intro sounds really doomy, but the rest of the song is, is just kind of kind of simple like war pigs is like very bluesy uh fairies yeah. wear boots is very 60s but because it has that darker doomier sound it does stand out where if they were just standard tuning they they, they wouldn't sound much different than the Yardbirds. no that's a really good point and i totally agree with that actually and i think the Yardbirds are great if you want to just look back one click from black sabbath i think the Yardbirds are your or your starter band there. Absolutely. And, and then all these bands kind of went hand in hand. It, it, it was just a, a lot of this stuff is it's the, the, the term that comes to mind is lightning in a bottle is so, a lot of these people, they were following trends and then they just accidentally did something different. I think, I think with certain bands, it was who they knew, like Van Halen, David Lee Roth having Gene Simmons connections is what put them up there. I, I I don't think they would have been what they were off the bat because of how Eddie played that. Mm-hmm. I think that was just, that was another coincidence because David Lee Roth, if he sang for another, like some other generic seventies, the crappy band, I think they would have still had the same poll because he knew Gene Simmons, but because of who Van Halen was a, as a player, they just were elevated to, to something else. And, and I think that's the story yeah. with a lot of these bands. That's a really good point. And I know David Lee Roth's uncle owned a club in New York, a fairly well-known nightclub. And I don't know if it was a jazz club, but it was he had some root in show business there. And I was thinking when you were talking about Van Halen back in that era, in the, the club era out in California, one of their big competitors was Quiet Riot. They're a real good example of, you had Randy Rhodes, and Kevin Dubrow, I mean, great band, but not, it, they didn't, you know, Randy didn't break out until he left and, and joined with Ozzy. So maybe Van Halen would have toiled in that same, you know, rel- I mean, they weren't exactly obscure or quiet riot, but they would have toiled at a slightly lower level without those connections. That That's for sure. I mean, it took Randy hooking up with Ozzy to kind of break out of, of that scene. And then I, I guess quiet riot. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the simplified version is they just piggybacked on Randy yes. to become the quiet ride that everybody knows and loves, you know? Yeah. And, and Ozzy had been doing it at, at that point for 12 years. So, it, so the, it basically took Randy Rhodes to piggyback off of 12 years of, of Ozzy Osbourne's success for, for that to happen. And, but, and as as good of a player Van Halen is, Randy Rhodes is not that much worse or just a, a different kind of player. It's not like Eddie Van Halen just outclasses him on everything. Like he they different they definitely had different play styles, but Randy Rhodes was just every good a, a tapper as Eddie Van Halen was. I totally mean his most memorable solos are are very similar to Eddie's. There was a documentary it was about a year ago. You you guys have both probably seen it. It was a year or two ago about Randy Rhodes, and I thought it was incredibly well done. It doesn't it didn't look particularly high budget to me, but they went back and interviewed. Really, they did good meaty interviews with the people that knew him and played with him and talked about his upbringing and how his I guess his mom was a music teacher and how dedicated he was to his craft. And they talked some about the quote unquote rivalry with Van Halen, which I thought was very interesting. Anyway, it was very. I forget the name of it. You know, apparently I'm going to be no good with names here, but it was very informative and I think made quite a case for Randy being, you know, every bit as dangerous as Eddie Van Halen in terms of the evolution of the rock and roll that came after him. The other thing I was going to add about Randy is that plane crash happened at about 40, I guess it's about 45 minutes from here in Leesburg. I've been out to that 
location, not on the property, because you can only get to sort of an outer gate. It's sort of a, a large house on, you know, a bunch of acres. And I guess back in the day, whoever owned the house, and they may still own the house, I don't know, but they used to provide touring buses for, you know, touring rock acts. So anyway, so it was a, you know, a, a fairly affluent piece of property out in Leesburg. And of course the house has been rebuilt from the plane crash, but you can get, I, I took some good pictures of it, but you can get right up to, it just goes to show you how obsessive I am. I actually drove out there and took photos of the crash site, but Anyway, pretty interesting. I had a chance to see Randy in the early 80s, and I didn't go, and I've always regretted that. It's called uh, Randy Rhodes Reflections of a Guitar Icon. Thank you. Ex it's excellent. And I don't, I don't endorse a lot of rock documentaries, but I actually learned a lot, which is rare. And I thought it was, it was just well done without being pretentious or too showy, and they, they did a real good job. Yeah, and... And that, and that that's the the best example possible of just raw talent is not going to be what elevates you, because huh. yeah, Quiet Quiet Riot just capitalized off of Randy Rhodes' death, sadly. And, and I don't know if it was I don't want to blame Quiet Riot, but I'm sure that this was a a, a record label idea. Like, ooh, you were the the band with the, this guy before he died. Like, oh, I'm sure yeah. there's something in here because the you know Metal Health was a big album, and I think Metal Health itself, may, maybe it was Come On Feel the Noise, but I think Metal Health was the first metal song to hit number one as a single. I think it yeah, was Metal Health. It's one of those. And I think two. it was the first. I think it was the first metal album to hit number one. Also, I think that they. they Mm -hmm. They they really scored there. I mean, you and I could probably argue. You you DJ Vince and AC could probably argue <laughs> what other metal albums might have hit number one before that. But I metal don't think there was a, another one. I think it's self identified. Yeah. I mean, you could argue Zeppelin or Deep Purple. I wouldn't, or I, I wouldn't call those metal bands though, because one, they don't call themselves metal bands, and they don't sound like metal bands. It's just seventies. Yeah. It's just it's just like like if there's a, a progression in rock, they're just the step after blues rock. Hmm. They're they're those those bands are the 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 link to Maiden Priest and Motorhead. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree with that because you go from like Eric Clapton and the Blues Breakers through groups like Jethro Tull and Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and the groups that sort of sp sprang up in the late '60s that led to heavy metal. So yeah, yep, agreed. Score one. Yeah, and. and I and I don't, and I think Black Sabbath is one of those bands that gets called a metal band, but I think that's just an association with Ozzy because Ozzy was like Ozzy Osbourne music is very Dio, Iron Maiden, Saxon. It's it's very much that type of music. Where Black Sabbath, you go back and listen to it. Sure, there's a few songs here and there that are heavier in nature, but yeah. you, it's like when you when you have let's okay a good example is the song, the razor's edge, the ACDC song. Cause yeah. you know, what, what are, what are the two singles from that album? Pop quiz. Oh Lordy. So is it, was it like thunderstruck and, uh, money, money, money talks? What? Yep. I, I, yes. I, I might have my albums. Go no, no. There. You, yes. That, that, that's them. But so w would you call either of those songs like metal songs? No way. No, but I'm then, not, to me, ACDC is a boogie band, not a metal band. They're exactly. Like ZZ Top to exactly. But then you hear the Razor's Edge, and it is a very heavy song. But because yeah. these bands have heavy songs, doesn't mean like okay, well they're they're a metal band. Because I yeah. think, and I think that's the stupid shortcut that that people do with with Black Sabbath, like people that don't listen to metal specifically, that like like people that like rock and country. We'll call Black Sabbath a metal band, and then, yeah, you're not really qualified uh, to be part of this argument. <laughs> so, she, well, go if ahead. No, I mean your point is well taken, man. If you don't know and you can't make the distinction between different kinds of sounds like that, and that's not necessarily a criticism, but if you're a casual listener and you're like, yeah, that they have long hair uh, and they play songs with these like heavy riffs with a lot of sustain, they must be a metal band. I mean, I'm yeah. not excusing it, but yeah, I mean, you're right, yeah, right, but, yeah. Yeah, and and the the long hair is, is is a good jumping off point because Dio his the reason he came up with with the horns 
was he said he always saw Ozzy throw in the peace sign. He's like, well, when I think, mm-hmm. or I see that, I think of Richard Nixon. I don't want to be Richard Nixon. So then he did something ah. to differentiate himself. That's what came up Italian with that. My Italian grandmother used to, used to do the horns, and she used to tell me it was the, the evil loik. eye. The loik, yeah. Well, that's what Dio said. That's what it was. Uh, they describe so he's a nice, it in Dracula. Nice Italian boy. He probably picked it up from grandma. And, and, and in Sicily, this was the evil eye, which is like, I don't know, I put a curse on your house kind of a thing. Well, there was two. <laughs> there was one where you... It's one's a ward and, uh, and one's a curse. So huh. there's two ways to do it. Like when you point it at someone, I, I, I can't remember, but if you point it at someone versus pointing it straight up, one is like you're cursing someone and one is you're guarding from the curse. And if nice. you read, if you read the book, Dracula, it's actually that, that thing is described like they, hmm. like it's written the, 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 when he meets, when, um, uh, Renfield meets the gypsies. They describe it as them putting uh, their pinky and pointer finger uh, pointed towards them. So huh. it, yeah, it's it, it's it's an actual thing. He didn't just do that. Like Gene Simmons says, he created it on the Love Gun. But the way he he's did. the way he's doing. Yes, it, Gene Simmons also invented rap. He also invented right, music. Right. He invented <laughs> he invented dirt. Yeah, that, right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, but but he's when you have your thumb out, it's sign language for "I love you." Hmm. So it's on the Love Gun album, and he's doing "I love you." So I think he was genuinely doing sign for "I love you" because it was you know it's Love Gun versus Dio is doing something very specific that has associations with some kind of sorcery, and you know Dio's into that stuff. You know he's an elf and. So he's, he's probably, I, I don't know. Can someone confirm was Dio actually into dungeons and dragons? Like he uses so Mm. much fantasy Mm. imagery above other bands. Like he seems like that, like he was in a band called elf. So it seems like he's either really into either Lord of the Rings Mm. or dungeons and dragons. Cause I don't know. Dungeons and dragons came out sometime in the seventies. I would say elf was probably early seventies. So it might predate that. I don't know. Cause w- when was the, when was the first rainbow album? Was it 75? Was it... I think it was 75. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So elf had to be before that. So unless dungeons and dragons is from like 1970 or something. It, it, it could be, I mean, I'm no I, expert, I but it could go back. It could go back even further. I, who knows? Yeah, because his artwork, like Holy Diver, seems very like Fantasia almost. Like it's it's more than most metal bands, more fantasy stuff. So he just seems like a nerd. So this seems like like a nerdy yes. thing that he thought yes. of. It is yeah. very nerdy. Like if you weren't looking at, I mean, Dio's got this great voice and his delivery is fabulous. But if you listen to those first couple Rainbow albums. Yeah, it's straight out of D and D. Some of the some of the imagery and Stargazer. I mean, as great as those songs are, and as scary as they can be as rock and roll, the lyrics are just like quest. It's like it's like <laughs> medieval quest type lyrics to me. So yeah, it could have been straight out of either Dungeons and Dragons or whatever fantasy liter- literature preceded that. So, yeah, yeah. A, it says that he played Dungeons and Dragons every weekend in high school. There okay. you go. All right. Yeah. All right. There we go. Yeah. I, 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 I always got that impression, but I, I never looked it up because I was thinking like, man, he has to predate D and had, I, I, had, uh. I had no idea just cause elf I'm, I'm pretty sure like before J.R.R. Tolkien came about elves, just kind of like baked cookies and, and helped Santa <laughs> with his presence. And then he Keebler. just. Yeah, and he just the JR token just gave him an extra dimension, but I I, I pfft, but what what do I know about D&D? I just know it's something from the 70s and it still goes on today. I don't know how popular it is, but it, it's always been the nerdy thing. And Dio has always been of of all the metal bands. Dio has always been like the nerdy one. Hmm. That's I mean, a really interesting observation. I don't think I've ever heard him described that way, but I think you have a really good point there. I mean, that, that was how I perceived it. Cause you know, Judas priest, well, I mean, we know about Rob Halford now, but like the dude wore all the leather and spikes and he came out on a Harley and right. you know, yeah, I, I, right. iron, iron maiden with like, with all the, the scary monster zombie imagery, you know, and the motorhead motorhead just feels like, like, turn the hell's angels into music 
And then, you know, Ozzy peed on the Alamo, bit the head off a bat, like the junkie. And then there's just Dio, who's this five foot tall Italian guy who's like holding a sword and then (laughs) singing about like goblins and stuff. Like he's the nerd. As much as I love Dio, but not all members of Dio. He made a nice counterpoint to Richie Blackmore and Cozy Powell on those early Rainbow records. Because Richie Blackmore, I think, just carries like a general like aura of darkness with him. And I'm sure a lot of that is just intentional, you know, image building, which he's been very successful at, a lot like Jimmy Page. But you you put Richie in with Ronnie James Dio and you get that nice blend of, you know, medieval fantasy and just dark, metal-y rock and roll riffs just i thought it was a nice and i i'm a big cozy powell fan so the the blending of those particular i mean the other guys in that band are great too but those three in particular are such noteworthy you know individual musicians it made for a nice a nice mix it's not something that richie could have achieved with deep purple because ian gillen is an entirely different kind of presence than ronnie james really just great what about david coverdale i think he's great too i'm i'm a a bit of a heretic on purple because I like, I like all the iterations of that band. I like Joe Lynn Turner. I like Coverdale. I like Ian Gill. I like all those. I like Rod Evans, the first singer. I think they were all great. And the band would change a lot with each, you know, obviously with each new lead vocalist, it's like replacing Bon Scott or replacing David Lee Roth. You get this new sounding band that has some sort of sonic link to the old band, but it's an entirely different animal. I think Coverdale's great. And I even like the album with Coverdale and Tommy Bowen. I think that's a great album. Was it Come Taste the Band? I just I'm a big Purple fan. Any any Splinter group, any Purple solo, anything. I just I eat all that stuff up. Well, it's funny when you bring up ACDC. Uh, as far as all bands that have changed singers, most of them ended up changing their sound. I think ACDC is the only one that didn't. Like, have either of you guys read that book, or maybe both of you have? I forget the name of the author, I, but he's written two books about ACDC, and one no. of them was about Bon Scott called like The Last Highway. Are you familiar with that book? No. Yeah. Okay, no. so long story really short. I forget the author. He's pretty much an ACDC scholar, if there is such a thing. He wrote one book about the Young Brothers and one book about Bon. Anyway, the Bon book, very interesting. A lot of Florida stuff, so I liked it because Bon spent a lot of time in Miami. But anyway... He basically builds this case for Back in Black, basically having been written before Bond died, like like his set of lyrics for that album were complete. And they just made that transition to Brian because they knew they were on the cusp of, you know, the big breakthrough album. It's very interesting. I mean, it didn't really cast any aspersions on Angus and Malcolm or Brian. They were just kind of like they lost their singer due to misadventure. They didn't want to break up their band. They knew they were about to, you know, bust large. So they just kind of carried on and said that Brian wrote the lyrics when in fact he did not. Very interesting. Anyway, it's worth the read if you're into if you're into ACDC. It's a, it's an interesting little read. That I had no idea about. But there is a there is an interesting parallel with ACDC and Metallica where Hi- Highway to Hell wa- was the big album, but they didn't really hit mainstream until Back in Black and just same with and justice for all. And then they hit it big with the black album. Yeah. So yeah, Yeah, that's, that's a good parallel actually. Excellent. Just, just from a sales perspective, we're back in black is actually a good album and a good, it's not as good as highway to hell. I I think the best, I think the best ACDC album is actually power age. That is an excellent album. All, all, all of those Bon Scott albums are just some of the best seventies rock albums that anyone will ever hear, but all those other bands, like my, I, I really do go back and forth. It is tough for me to pick a favorite maiden album, but it does. It, it is brave new world and killers are generally the ones that I go to the most. And it just depends on which one have I not listened to in a while, but killers and number of the beast could not sound more different. Like those are completely different albums, and and I'm I'm a I'm a Paul Diano defender until I die. It's it's just with the like when you hear Bruce Dickinson sing Paul Diano songs, it it sounds off. 
Just like if you were to hear Paul Diano singing, you know, Paul Diano, I think you could get away with the evil that men do, but like Paul Diano doing most Bruce Dickinson songs, there's, there's a, a drama to Bruce Dickinson's singing is, is what elevates that where yeah. ev- everyone I think just says Bruce Dickinson is the better singer because he's just been in the band for so long that it's, it's hard to imagine the band without him. And when they went to blaze Bailey, those albums sound completely different where just take the three singers and then plug them into any song you would, you could get some hits here and there. And a good example is there is a live version of future reel that Bruce hmm. Dickinson sang on. I, I want to say it was a show before the brave new world tour, or it might've been on that tour, but it sounds pretty good. And I'm pretty sure, um, virtual X I was, they, they initially wanted Bruce Dickinson to sing on it. I, I, I heard most of it was written with Bruce Dickinson in mind. And then for some reason, either contractual obligations or Bruce mm-hmm. Dickinson didn't want to jump in yet, but he didn't sing on it. But I'm, I'm, I heard that he was supposed to sing on future reel. No, like no matter, no matter what, like this is, this is a Bruce Dickinson song where like you hear things like the angel and the gambler. Oh my gosh. That song is, it's so bad. And I'm, I'm not even a big hater of that era, but it's, it's just, it's Iron Maiden. Like, let's, let's try not being Iron Maiden for a while. Cause Blaze Bailey does kind of have a Paul Diano sound to him, just without the range of Paul Diano. Interesting. Well, yeah. you've got Bruce Dickinson being sort of iconic when the average music fan thinks of Iron Maiden, I, they probably see Bruce Dickinson in their mind just because those are the albums where they kind of rose to national prominence, but they're all, all three of those guys are competent. I mean, they're more than competent, but they're all competent vocalists, but yeah, you've got an entirely different sound. Reminds me of the guy that, uh, what was his name? Karabi who replaced Vince John Neal and Mark. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are all good. I mean, they're not going to, or, or Gary Sharon who sat in, you know, I think he sounds like Sammy Hagar. I don't, I really don't hear any difference. I mean, the music is different, but like, I just, I just hear like a lot of those highs. I just hear Sammy Hagar. Yeah. I I think it was very similar. And I, I read, I don't know if this is true. I read this in an interview with Patty Smythe, uh, the vocalist who said that she was actually offered. I don't remember if it was before Sammy or right after Sammy, but she, it might've been after Sammy. She was offered the lead vocalist slot in Van Halen and passed on it because they, there was, a, she said there was too much drinking. They were all drinking too much or, or some one or more of them were drinking too much and she didn't want to get involved. But I think that would have made for obviously a radical departure from. Oh, everyone Roth, would have hated Hagar. it. They would have no, hated probably, it. but it they probably would have been great. You know, there's no, there's no talent. It's interesting that their minds were, drifting in that direction like let's get a female vocalist who doesn't have any background in this style of music it's it would have been a pretty pretty ballsy move you know oh yeah it absolutely would have been a well let's do something that no one would see coming now when you say patty Smythe, now is this uh because the night belongs to lovers or is this no, no, uh, no. <laughs> i am the warrior yeah it's the i am the okay. warrior the other okay. one's patty smith yeah it's okay, the yeah, i am the yeah. warrior the one from scandal yes yeah. okay i was yeah, yeah, ah. that yes that is uh that that's bold but i i think that they were really thinking like hey let's do something no one would see coming but then they they came to their senses cuz they would have gotten a lot of press but in the same way that oj simpson got a lot of press <laughs> Like, <laughs> like when anyone says, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Oh yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Oh yeah. Oh, in music for sure. Yeah. If you put in out everything. A... Yeah. So sometimes you draw attention to yourself, like William hung, and then you become a media sensation. Like with, I think William hung, he, he's some kind of genius. I, I can't remember but he was known for being the worst singer on American Idol. And then he got to have a brief career as a meme doing uh. terrible music. But he also had his fallback job as whatever rocket scientist or something. I, I, I can't remember. But the, the point is he made a fool of himself. 
and he got rewarded short term by being a professional fool, but he also had something to fall back on where he didn't tarnish his name as a musician, where if Van Halen went with, with Patty mm. Smythe, uh, everyone would talk about like, wow, they have a female singer after going from, you know, the, the, the manic masculine party guy, David Lee Roth to the, the powerful right. and emotional Sammy Hagar to the girl, but the, the album, it would have, it would have tanked harder than the Motley Crue album with John Karabi. And from what I hear is people kind of like that album, but they don't like it as a Motley Crue album. It feels very nineties right. rock like that dark, not grunge, but close enough. Right. Kind of like, like sounds of white noise, like the, the yeah. kind of nineties dark rock, I guess. They're definitely chasing who, I don't know who produced that album, but they were definitely chasing a bit of that sound. Oh. So I think that's, that's Was it valid. Bob Rock? Yeah, it's a, it, yeah, I'm probably, I, I don't have it in front of me, but that's uh it's certainly not Dr. Feel good, but yeah, they were chasing that sound. And I guess, I don't know if you lose your lead singer, I would assume like priority number one is like, okay, how do we, how do we make ourselves relevant and put ourselves on the charts with that identifiable sound with an entirely different vocalist? It's it, you know, the fans invest in that lineup of the band that they love and you bring the, you bring the band out there and there's somebody else in the vocalist slot. You're like, who is this? What, you know, what am I looking at here? So that's, it's really tricky. Skinner did that when they replaced, well, when Ronnie Van Zant died, they replaced him with, uh, Dale Krantz for the Rossington Collins band. And it was an entirely different, entirely different animal that, that band, it became much more of a, a bluesy. Uh, she almost had like an, like almost like a gospel R and B style rock and roll voice. And they, luckily they had the songs to support that album and it was a, a good, strong album, but fans will like, it's like when Springsteen dropped the E street band in the early nineties, whenever it was, when he did human touch and lucky town, his fans went berserk. They're like, who are these other players? This doesn't sound right. You know, he was put under enough pressure that he had to hire the E Street band back, you know, to kind of carry on and, you know, to do his Bruce Springsteen. Van Halen probably would have had the same problem. The fans would have been like, yeah, I'm not, we're not buying this. Yeah. It's like, we, 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 we stuck with you once and it was a, it was a tough ask, but you know, we, right. you were able to kind of show, show your, your, your gravitas with Sammy Hagar. But no, yeah. we're not doing it again because you, again, you, you go too far, then it's, it stops being that thing. But yes, Bob rock did produce that album. But when you, the Motley Crue album with John Karabi and, uh, it's one thing to replace members of a band, but to replace a vocalist, cause that's, that's your main sound. That's, that's the first thing that you recognize, even even through a good example is I'm the one by Van Halen as very sh that, that album or the, sorry, that track is probably more overindulgent in guitar playing than eruption. Mm -hmm. And, and David Lee Roth is still more recognizable because that's just what, what the average person resonates with because you hear talking just about every single day of your life. So that thing that just, it, it hits you first. So even though the guitar playing is probably the best guitar playing in any, in any mm. track on that album, the vocals still pop mm. out more. I hear Roth and Michael Anthony. When I think of that song, I can't, I cannot escape Michael Anthony's background. Great playing, man. No, that's no, that's a, it's a, that, that's, that song really showcases what that band is about. And, I yeah. think I, that's one of those rare occasions where I will say, yeah, the first album is the best. Cause I'm, I'm not one of those, the first album's the best type of people. Cause I think people get stuck into that mindset where you're like, that's where they're the hungriest. They have the most to prove, but yeah, I, well. I think a lot of bands actually come out of their, they come out of their shell. They get more comfortable and they, yeah. And sometimes you can take risks. Like ACDC is, is the most risk averse band in the history of the world, but that is a <laughs> band funny. that, that a, as they went on it at a certain point, I, I'd say after for those about to rock, they're like, okay, whatever, this is, this is what we're doing from now on. We're just going to do this yeah. until we can't do it anymore. But the, just that, that high voltage to 
uh, Highway to Hell. That is that is the perfect sweet spot of just not doing anything different, just doing the same but better. I think the songwriting improved. Yeah, and actually, while we're talking about for those about to rock that book that I mentioned, I think. I think they claim that Bon Scott wrote for those about to rock too, not the whole album, but that the track, the lyrics for that track, the, the, that was a Bon Scott thing. And that was a holdover from the back in black sessions. Cause they knew they needed a follow up. And apparently I don't, I mean, I am talking way out of school here, but apparently Brian Johnson's not the great lyricist that Bon was. So they didn't necessarily have a bunch of stuff in reserve to follow up back in black. And I don't know, like I said, it's a book. I don't know, you know, how much of it's true for, you know, gospel truth, but pretty interesting. But anyways, yes, agreed on ACDC and, and definitely being risk averse. Good grief. They are, look up risk averse in the dictionary. You get a picture of ACDC. It's the same, <laughs> the same two chord boogie thing. Not that they don't do it well. And you're right about first albums because ACDC is a great example of that. So is the Who or the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Zeppelin. All of those bands got better a few albums into the game. So I think you've got a good point there too, actually. Yeah. I think there are plenty of bands where you, you, you get your first one and it just will never be a, as good as that. But I, I think one of the big problems was, and we've discussed this is, and this is really true of new musical acts is people get really big too fast. And mm. so you get bands that their first album is, a big seller. So they get lazy off the bat where you used to have bands. They would, they would be successful, but it would take a while for them to be huge. And, yeah. and that's where you get a lot of, a lot of, I was listening to, um, uh, once bitten twice shy the other day by great mm. white. Mm. And I was thinking, man, there's no reason that this shouldn't be mainstream music. Now, like anyone would want to hear music like that. Like, everyone yeah. would want to hear music like that, but it really, that got replaced by this new crappy country. It's like rap crap. I, I have no, I guess I, I yeah. guess you have to call it crap. It's country rap. <laughs> it just, that's actually a really funny hybrid name, but AC man, think about it. So like if you had a, that's an Ian Hunter song, once bitten, twice shy. Ian Hunter's a great songwriter. So if you took once bitten, twice shy and tried to release it as a single, now it would have to be a country single. Exactly. That, that, that's, that's the only avenue f for stuff like that. It's why post Malone went to doing country because right. the, the rap field is just so cluttered with people that just kill each other or, or sing songs about how many STDs they have. And, rock and, and there ain't, there ain't going to be a rock and roll track that breaks into the, you're not going to get like top 20 pop hit with a rock band anymore. Not, not even like the marquee rock bands are, are making hit singles. So I, it would have to be a country song. You could, you can kind of hear the swing in it. If you think about it, you know, maybe not with great white, but all you got to do is put a twang in that song. Exactly. Got, yeah, country. Yeah. Rock right there. I was going to say that do, you do that exact same song, but give the singing twang and it'd be, yeah. it, it'd be indistinguishable from nineties cool. country. Yeah, I was gonna say you'd have to have like digital drums too because they, they like having That's that true. beat. So there, that actually reminds you of something. So there's one little genre we kind of missed, and it's um, it's like this this low T pop rock. And when I said that to someone, they're like, <laughs> "What is low T?" Like, well, <laughs> like because all these other bands. If you have to about, ask what low uh, T is, you may oh, need to go yeah. to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so. Some of these bands that I just despise, like I hate everything about them. I think they're just the worst, and it, it's just Guns and Roses. Just, it's just awful. No, Panic at the Disco, oh, yeah. Fall Out Boy, oh, and Maroon no, Five, and those no are the, 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 wait, wait. There's a, there's another one. Uh, um, is it Mike 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 Chemical Romance? Mike Chemical, yes, yeah, that yeah. too. Where and like all these bands, they like paint their nails and like. It, squeaky they, voice bands yeah they, they sound like mice you know and i think they they um came out what like the 2000s like that's what was like the next jump yeah. off from yeah. from like the grunge movement like that's what you got thanks <laughs> and, and there and there was still something pretty masculine about a lot of those grunge people they were yeah. basically like men that had given up on life that was kind of the the vibe <laughs> that they gave out. And then these guys were like 12 year old girls 
in like 30 year old men's bodies. It was like all the songs were very sad, but in like a, in like a middle school way, like my girlfriend broke up with me and I, I, I wish I could hold her hand again. And well, and we haven't done this, this episode, but like the episode of South Park where Stan joins the goths. And then they're all, they're all writing poetry about how dark and sad life is. And then Uh, Stan is like reading, I want to say it's the lyrics for heaven by Brian Adams. And they're like, what what are you doing? That's not, that's not what your poetry is supposed to be. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then that's how I feel about a lot of these people. Like, what are you doing? Like you're grown men. It's, it's, it's like. They're singing songs that Taylor Swift would write the, like the lyrics for, but they have distorted guitars. So it tricks people into yeah. thinking that there's some kind yeah. of edge. And this, and this is my whole problem with new metal because it's not metal. They just have distorted guitars. So these people think that this is edgy music because they have distorted guitars, but what take, take the distort, the distortion away from these bands. What's the difference between them and John Mayer? Ugh, and you can start it on him, man. <laughs> but now, okay. So to your point, DJ, to your point. So you've got these bands that emulated the glam rock style of the early seventies. You've got these bands like, well, Queen was a great glam rock band. T Rex, The Sweet, et cetera, et cetera. Even ACDC in the New York States. Dolls. The New York Dolls. Okay, so they they pulled that same fashion. In a lot of cases, not every case, but in a lot of cases, they had the songs to back it up. And I think the difference between what those bands were doing back suzy quattro great female glam rock act and the the Bitch. runaways which you can get they all had the great they all had the tunes these guys in the early 2000s i knew all those bands because one of my daughters was the right age that the, all those bands kind of cycled through her <laughs> life <laughs> in junior high they didn't really have the songs i don't think and i you no. know I'm, my ears are going to be biased but i don't i couldn't name one track from any of those bands that struck me as particularly memorable and i think the origin of that sound that you're talking about might have come out of the early 70s with the introspective downbeat singer songwriter types i won't mention any names but you know the james taylors the cat stevens the john I won't mention Denver. any names names three names <laughs> right 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 won't mention any i don't want to disparage anybody but those those early sort of introspective even early john lennon where it's just sort of like you know i'm, I'm sitting here ruminating and here's my you know here's my song that just sort of gave way to a lot of stuff in the eighties like that. There were a lot of bands in the eighties that were very like inward looking. Well, there's the one band, the perfect example of it is, and you know, which band I'm talking about. I know, I know what I'd say here, but what, what, who are you going to say? You go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if, if you're wrong. Okay. I was going to say the cure. Yep, exactly. Oh, Oh, look at that. The, the, yeah, that's why I said you're wrong because yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like an opinion. The, the cure was sad, happy music, right? Because they, they do have some pretty dark sounding songs and some song like, like the kiss has like a really big build up and like that's, that has a really good punch to it. The, one of my favorite albums of all time is blood flowers and not just mm. favorite album by the cure, just in general, I've listened to that mm. album so many times and people like to say disintegration is the best one, but disintegration has, it, it has pictures of you, which is, you know, was a big yeah. hit, but it it's has popular. that, it has that very reverby, almost ethereal sound to it. So it, it sticks out more where I think blood flowers is the more, it, it, it's, it's the more personal album. It, it's, it's the darker one, but that music was, man, there, there's something about it that is appealing on a musical level. Cause oh, yeah. the, the, the cure did evolve. Like the, the first album, the three imaginary boys, it's, it's a, it sounds very like the cars, like seventies cars. Mm. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. uh, 10, 15 on a Saturday. No, it, it doesn't have that. Like when you think of what the, obviously it has boys don't cry, which when you think of the cure, that's what you think of. And that, that's a very radio friendly track, but that's not most of their songs like blood flowers and wish I I've, I've listened to those albums so many times. And then there are, there are the more like sad and Oh God, what was me songs to them? But the music stands out. Like well, I was like, just going to say the cure can write a song. The difference between groups like the cure and Depeche mode with sort of a more industrialized version of the cure. 
The reason those bands still resonate, in my opinion, is they have these great catalogs full of these great songs. Whereas My Chemical Romance, just as a or Maroon Five, they don't have the they don't have the catalog. They just they they might have the look or they might have the vibe of some of that stuff, but they just don't have, in my opinion, at least, the songwriting chops to create a body of work that's just gonna last for thirty or forty years. I so yeah, I love the Cure. I think they're great. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard. All the bands DJs listed a bunch of times, I cannot mm. name one song by them. Actually, <laughs> that's not true. I can name one song by Fall Out Boy. It's a cover of Beat It, and it's terrible. <laughs> but other than that, I, I like these are bands I've heard plenty of times, and I can't name one song, and I don't remember anything about it. They're not memorable. There's, there's no, nothing about there's them that no. stands out. It, it's just they were popular for 12 year old girls and those a lot of those girls never matured so they stayed popular with them and boys like them because the girls like them like people went to hair metal bands in the 80s because that's where the girls were but the thing is those dudes in hair metal bands as as feminine as they looked, they were genuine tough guys like they would like win fights like they would start and win fights like Mo no one could call motley crew in the 80s pussies you just, you could not like those guys were genuine badasses. I might grant you, I'm like, I'm more of a rat guy than a Motley Crue guy. Well, of I know course. Some, yeah. Rat's a better band, but I'm just, but yeah, in my mind, but the rivalry Crue, is between, but everyone knows Motley Crue off stage though. Well, yeah, no. Yeah. They have, the that's, that's what I, that's what I mean. Doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I mean. Like no one would look at Motley Crue and, and say they don't, they don't walk the walk. Fair enough. Although it is a little tough to sift through all the sort of people magazine, just like with guns and roses, there's a lot of that celebrity baggage well, surrounding. Sure. Tommy sure, sure. was so high profile and stuff, you know? Sure. But they aren't the guys from, you know, my chemical romance where they're like 90 no. pounds and six feet. Totally five, different animal. Like, no, totally designed. different animal. Yeah. Like zero muscle. And they, if they did not have the status that they did by being propped up by big record labels, they, they, they'd be nothing. They, they'd be, they'd be incels. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't care if they're here. Okay. So here you go. So I don't care if they're all incels, if they can make a good album full of good songs. So my, my preference is going to be based on like, if you want to drop a band into the stream of rock and roll and say, here's a new band and a new album. If it's a good album and it has good songs and good production, then I, I'm all over it. I don't care who the band is comprised of. I don't care where they came from. I don't care if it's Barry Manilow and, you know, five of his cousins. What's wrong with Barry Manilow's cousins? I mean, is there such a thing? But if, if the album is good and the songs are good, then I'm on it. Where I lose, start to lose my mind with these bands is when when the music's bad and and hair metal gets a bad rap but if you go back and listen to a lot of it like rats a very good example some great albums floating around the catalogs a lot cinderella another band that has well, a lot of great songs I, we are cinderella respecters on this on this show i just i just think tom Kiefer is just i he is just the bee's knees and i i just think rat warren d martini and robin crosby are as good of a one two guitar combo is anything i could think of whether it's from the eagles or skinner or the heart I mean, it's pretty hard to find a band with that kind of mu muscle. I mean, I, I'm getting I'm getting sidetracked here, but I think yeah, I think there was a lot of great hair metal. There was a lot of great navel gazing early 2000s music. It's just not necessarily the bands that got the majority of the public acclaim, which takes us all the way back to that discussion about what gets put into the mainstream and what you know what's the goal there? Is it to is it to forward that particular style of music or is it to sort of Water it's a forward in, it, it's a forward a narrative it, it's it's ah. it's for narrative and watering down but you water down so you could push the things at the top up because there there are bands from the early 2000s there was an era of music that i like see i don't hate emo music blanket just like all emo Ooh, i hate it all it it has its place as being kind of more poppy punk. It's like more radio friendly. And there was a, a, a band that I thought was actually pretty good that was very popular for a very short period of time. And I think this is going to be the first time in uh, 21 years that this band has been mentioned. It's Alien Ant Farm. The name is familiar, but I'm not familiar with any of their music. Interesting. Okay. Well, their most famous song was a cover of Smooth Criminal. 
<laughs> you don't remember this? It's better than the Michael Jackson version. That's Absolutely. awesome. No, I don't think I've heard that. I like yes. that though. So they were, yeah, they were very popular. They had an album. I, I can't remember what it was called. It was called like Weren't they on the Spider-Man sound, soundtrack or something. I don't know. Maybe it's okay, possible. I don't, I, I can't tell you a song from the Spider-Man soundtrack. <laughs> I know there was a Nickelback song in one of them. And I only know that because people make fun of Nickelback. But other than that, I don't know. Yeah, they have a really good song called Movies. And and it's and it's a it's a very good early 2000s like pop rock hit where it doesn't feel like cynical pop rock. It's kind of like the 2000s answer to Cheap Trick. Where yeah, it's like go. it's like kind of more pop rock, but there's still a little bit of an edge to it. And, and that's what that band was like, but they didn't go very far. And a lot of these bands didn't go very far because this was kind of the era still where one hit wonders were a thing. Another good one is Fountains of Wayne, Stacy's mom. I love those guys. Yeah. That, and they're a decent band, but that was their only big hit. I, I really like too cool for school. And, and it, it's, it's, mm-hmm. I don't want to say mm-hmm. it's its own genre, but it, it feels very sixties. Yeah. but a little more contemporary. Like it doesn't have that, that jam crap to it where all, a lot of these bands were popular because they had one big hit and then that was it. You never heard from them again because they didn't have like a music identity in yeah. the way like metal. Here's metal. Here's the metal guys. Here's the metal bands. Here's the metal look or Here's the punk look here. The punk bands Here's the punk sound, even new wave. Like there's still something like new wavers are basically nerds, but there's still like a, a new wave, like look and feel and, and sound like a uh, ducky from, um, pretty in pink. There's your new waiver. And granted those, you know, don't be, don't be like ducky. Everybody be, be more, be more Dave Mustaine than ducky. There you go. There you go. But they didn't you know, have Ducky that. Didn't, Ducky did pretty well for himself out there, man, on Two and a Half Men. I think Ducky's Ducky's like retired now. So hats off to Ducky's business acumen, at least. Didn't he end up playing? I heard he's like Lex Luthor now. Pro- yeah, probably. John Cryer. Yeah, who knows, <laughs> yeah, man? That's what I'm I heard. sure he's doing something high profile. Yeah. I just I just know him from Hot Shots. He's the cross-eyed guy. I wasn't a big two and a half men fan, but I've never I mean, seen an episode. It was on like, was on like 45 years. You couldn't miss it. But yeah, I don't think I ever watched a full episode. Not my bag, but I certainly never did seen well for himself out there. Well, but yeah, he, did, so, but what, he didn't get the girl. The band you just mentioned, I mean, I'll give anybody credit for covering Smooth Criminal because that shows that they have musical awareness and a sense of humor, which is points in my book. But oh boy, do they have a sense of humor. What's memorable is that they've got good songs. You know, if you, if you've got the tunes, then 20 years later, somebody's going to be sitting on a podcast going, Oh yeah, there was this one band. They were great because this song and that song. And the, the problem with those bland bands that we were talking about a few minutes ago is they're just, it's just product, man. And then you, later you're like, what was it? Forget the name of the songs that they had, but I sort of remember the band. Cause the guy, you know, wore a full Dracula get up and had, whatever a widow's peak and a big black collar and that's about all you can recall <laughs> they wore, because the music there were welding of, goggles at night right. for some and they weren't trent reznor right 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 <laughs> Trent reznor that's funny yeah well, so yeah agreed agreed on all those bands yeah and, and those bands are they were popular for the same reason that the ultimate warrior was popular is you just had some people that were good at marketing and then they just pushed them to the moon and then they were just in every household in America. And therefore this is what I hear. This is what everyone else heard. Therefore, this is what everyone is listening to. And I don't want to be the outsider. So I like these bands just like everyone else does. Meanwhile, they don't realize that that's everyone else's train of thought. And then eventually it just gets it just gets memed into their brain and they don't realize that they don't actually like these bands. They just think it's the normal thing to do. You just, you like this band because that's just what's accepted. Just like you, you work eight hours and you sleep eight hours, you play eight hours. That's just what's expected. So yeah, you listen to my chemical romance, you eat three meals a day and you Hmm. get plenty of Hmm. seed oils and uh, high fructose corn syrup and, and partially hydrogenated (laughs) oils. And then that's just, that's just what you do. It's just, it's just part of living. I wonder if the corn syrup like drowns out certain receptors in your brain that allows you to decipher between good and bad music. But it's like the age old argument between, 
conformity and non-conformity in music. It's a, it's actually really well articulated what you said there. You've got some group of people who are just going to follow because everybody else is following. And then you've got all of us over here on the side going, no, 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 no that's crap. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're wasting your money. Well, and, and, hear it. and it's, and it's evident by, by how popular metal is outside of America. Cause if, if it were true that it were just some kind of absolute, you know, libertarian, complete free market, you know, let, let the, let the product speak for itself. Well, then you wouldn't have pockets where certain things aren't popular, where they have exposure to everything where yeah. metal is still big in South America and Europe where it's, and it's not as big here. Well, why is that? Oh, well, what's the difference between the people? Well, certainly there's no difference between people. So then it must be some kind of marketing thing. And if, if you, if you want something to be popular, you can make it popular because popularity is essentially based on a marketing, like, uh, the, like the Simpsons episode where Homer became a clown and he mm -hmm. just, he just saw all the billboards. So he was just driving on the highways. He saw all the billboards and he bought every single product that he saw on the billboard. And the last one was clown college. You can't eat that. And then all day he's just thinking about clowns. Like people like Carl's like, Hey, uh, Homer, your section's on fire. And then he looks at him and Carl's a clown dancing. And then these guys run in, they're on fire, but Homer sees them as like, they're like dancing, but they're just like on fire trying to put themselves out. And, and that just, that shows the effect that marketing has on the human brain. And people think they like things they actually don't. It's just been conditioned into their brain. Like, okay. So I've always had a theory about this and here's my little cheap theory based on what you just said. So as a person who shops for music regularly, and I'm really up to my ears in records and CDs and things, if I hit either a used record store, or if I'm at a thrift store at a garage sale, something like that. I find it very interesting that there's a certain group of artists whose, whose records I will see used secondhand. So to me, that indicates that I, the music fan, Vince, the music fan, I go out and I buy this new album uh, in 2024. I'm like, oh man, this is great. But then at some point, not too far down the road, I look at it and I'm like, I don't like this after all. And I'm going to donate it or I'm going to, you know, give it to the used record store. And I think that there's, there's a correlation there between what you said and how that works. Cause you go and you find these records by groups that were very popular for a very brief period of time or other bands, something the DJ and I were in about uh, on the telephone that create, they might be big bands like Dave Matthews is a good example, or there are some other ones, Red Hot Chili Peppers. But later you're listening to their album and you're like, this album doesn't really hold up for me. It just doesn't. 10 years later, five years later, you're like this, I'm getting rid of this. So it's interesting, but it's like a. But it's they like sold really well though. Yeah. Right. So you saw the billboard or the so ad. They must and be like, good. Going to buy. Right. But then later you're like, I just, I don't hear it anymore. Once the magic spell of the marketing has worn off, you listen to the album and you're like, eh, and you get rid of it. And, and you see the same you know, 25 or 50 bands in the used record bins, wherever you could find a record store anymore, but it's the same band. So it, it indicates to me that there is some, you know, there's magic to marketing, but there's also human beings after a certain point, even the thickest music fan will listen to something and go, yeah, this is actually no good. You can't fool everybody forever, you know? No, you can't. And going back to the ultimate warrior is they brought the ultimate warrior back in 1996 and the fans didn't like him the way they did in 1990 it's because you have to keep pushing that that marketing like you want to keep a band big you have to keep reminding everyone that that's your favorite band you yeah. love that band everyone loves that band if you don't do that like the, the reason taylor swift is as big as she is is because they don't stop talking about her whether it's talking about how successful she is as a businesswoman or how how die hard the swifties are or how much, oh, don't you hate that Taylor Swift? No matter what, there's always a conversation about Taylor Swift. So that's yeah. how they keep Taylor Swift at the top. If they just stop talking about her, 
then she'll just disappear. The, the Swifties aren't going to be like, Ooh, no, I, you, you can't, you can't tell me what to do about my queen. Sure. There, there's going to be plenty of people that are going to still like Taylor Swift. And, and again, I, I find Taylor Swift to be extremely C plus pop music at best. It's very inoffensive. It's the, the lyrics are what a girl like that. I'd expect to write lyrics about, especially considering the fan base she's targeting, but they could make a new Taylor Swift tomorrow. They could, they could turn someone else that's up and coming. Like who, who's that girl? I hate, uh, Betty, Betty who, <laughs> no, yeah. like they could turn Betty who probably not Betty who Betty who sucks. Uh, I, I they couldn't do it with Jojo Siwa cause she's a train wreck right now, but you could, uh, Billy Eilish could be definitely the next Taylor Swift. They could, they could build up a very similar mystique for her and they could yeah. just turn back the Taylor Swift hype. And then eventually like all they would need to do is Taylor Swift. Oh, I'm taking a break. I want, I want to have babies or whatever. What give her, her, her window some, will give definitely her some, close, dude. Yeah. Just yeah. like Michael Jackson's window closed in the early 80s. He was the biggest thing since well, well, in all, Presley, in Beatles, all you know? fairness, they did lay a bunch of accusations of child molestation against him. Now, and I yeah, am still, ske- I am skeptical of a lot of those claims uh, with all things considered, but that was how they dialed it back. Cause I think yes. he was very, I think they turned him off. And I think that a lot hey, of that had to do with him buying the, the, the Beatles library and the, and the TV studio. That may be. I, yeah, I won't argue with that either way. I don't know much about his story other than what I've seen on, you know, in the headlines. However, having been there, he peaked with Thriller. The next album did really well. I mean, these albums sold well, but his sort of ubiquitous, like, king of media thing really only flashed for a few years. And yeah, and those those accusations did show up, but I, I, the timeline in my mind was a little bit later once he had sort of gone up. Well, it bad was down, bad but. debuted at number one and that and not many records did that at the time. Like that was kind of a big deal when bad debuted at number one. And what was the album? Was it dangerous? Dangerous was still a number one album. I think it was I think dangerous was the, yeah, the second one after, after thriller. And, and no, yeah, I, I mean, a, he yeah, thought was going to be a big artist. And I think if Taylor Swift can morph into a more mature songwriting style, she can take a certain percentage of her audience with her as she gets older as a, as a human being. Cause you know, your audience sort of changes with you, but I think these pop idols only have a, a window of a few years and they have to make bank and, you know, get ready for the next transition. And you're right. They will take somebody else and they will elevate them to that. Look at Lady Gaga who had, who morphed into a, an actor, you know, after that. So they, you, they got to have something else to do because that, that, young audience you will hold their attention for a couple of years then they're on to the next person it's very it's very commodity oriented to me like like pop tarts or you know tv or what or whatever i think lady gaga eats children <laughs> i mean that unironically i mean that with it with every every inch of my body as honest be as i've ever been i believe she does i believe she's some kind of demon witch I don't think she, I, I feel like her popularity, there is some kind of, like, she is like a succubus and, um, like, like Stan, uh, Cartman, Kyle and Kenny, like we, I see through it and I, I know we just need to play her song backwards and that's how we defeat her, but she should not be as popular as she is. She had a few catchy songs and then she like wins an Oscar and then, and now they put her in like Joker too. Like, like she, she was in the Sopranos. Was she really? Yes. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't recognize her out of, you know, out of character. If, as, if, as if you, if you, I could, I could send you the episode and I'd point it out and you'd go, oh, wow. That really does look like a young lady Gaga. Cause as she got older, she got more, um, witch looking. And she, she looked a little slightly different when, when she was younger, but yeah, she's, she's, um, she's one of, uh, Anthony jr's classmates in in one episode. 
Yeah, okay, I, interesting. I knew well, she had a, an acting background, so that makes sense. And the timeline would, would be about right for when The Sopranos was on. That's interesting. Well, yeah, and she, she's a teenager at the time, and then it's just, huh. you know, someone's this, and then she becomes one of, like, probably the biggest music star in the world. And then she wins an Oscar, and then she's shilling migraine medication. Well, she was she was really <laughs> big. Pfizer. Like, she had a couple of years there, and then she she very wisely, I thought, did that album with Tony Bennett. To, I don't even know what that is. Oh, dude. I mean, I don't want to hear it, but my point is she looked at her audience and thought, well, I'm going to outgrow this teen, this teen audience that's filling up these stadiums. So she did an, like a jazz standards, you know, sort of like a crooner album with Tony Bennett that did really well for her, won a Grammy, et cetera. But that was her, you know, obvious attempt at let's, let's go for an older audience. So well, she I was think eating her younger audience. Well, there's that, but there, I think Taylor <laughs> Swift is going to have to, to make a similar, she's going to have to kind of follow like a Stevie Nicks path where you go, okay, we've Become done an the actual pop witch. Star thing. Yeah. Well, there you go. But we got to do the pop star thing and then move up the food chain to an older, more sophisticated rock and roll audience that wants to hear something a little bit different. It'll be interesting to see what she does. I mean, she could retire. She could go into business with that kind of money. You've got all these options, you know, who knows? Isn't she, isn't she already in business technically? Isn't she well, like yes. a billionaire? Probably. I think she yeah. is. And she, you know, obviously is dating that Kansas City Chiefs player, Travis Kelsey. So maybe that was a different way to cast a wider net. But it it, is. Ca- it keeps her in the conversation because during the Super Bowl, it was just like, oh, let's look at Taylor Swift. You know, for no it's reason. good for her and good for the <laughs> NFL. I mean, look how many people that wouldn't pay any attention to the NFL are all of a sudden oh, yeah. like, oh my gosh. Taylor Swift and look, NFL player. It's good yeah. for both of them. Good branding. Yeah, twelve year old girls not watching the Super Bowl, but they hear Taylor Swift is going to be there, and then just every right. time the ball stops, so look, look, Taylor Swift. Very. It was. I thought that was so weird. Like, like why the amount of times, like you, you know, you pan to a celebrity in, in sport events, like and look, and Mike Tyson's in the audience, and the Mike Tyson hmm. waves or so, something like that. But they just kept doing it with her. They look, kept she's doing picking her it. nose. Yeah, well, I wish that's what was happening. That would be funnier. <laughs> well, I, I do think that someone will tell her, I don't think any of these artists, especially modern artists, I don't think they have these ideas like, oh, you know, I've got a, I'm, my audience is getting older, so I need to do this. I think their, their agents or managers make every single play for them. I think every single one of them says, okay, if, like you want to be a star. This is what you do. There, uh, Mark Dice wrote a book years back called like the Illuminati of, of the music industry. And, and then he said, these people essentially metaphorically sell their souls. What they do is they, they sign the contract that says you do whatever the record company tells you to do. And that's the idea of the soul is your free will. So you forego your free will. And for a lot of these people, it pays off. But for some of these people, like you debase yourself and and for, for what just, you get to be Betty who, I mean, that's the, like, I can't think of a worse fate for someone than being Betty who, but Lady Gaga, she gets to be, I I don't know if she won an Oscar. I know she won one of those awards. She was in that movie with Bradley Cooper and she, she won something, but still that's in that industry. I mean, I don't, I could not care less. Like if, if I met someone and they're like, I won an Oscar for like, I built the set in Jaws or something. I don't know if someone did that, but I'd be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But like an actor, like I won an Oscar. Like, isn't, didn't the, didn't the females of that just, those were the girls that got raped by Harvey Weinstein. Isn't that how they got their Oscar? Oh, snap. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what, what came out. Like all the girls that accused Harvey Weinstein were all women that won best actress. It was like all of them. That is a dark story, dude. That guy. Oh, yeah. Well, oh. yeah, but those are but those are the people that run those industries. And so yeah. I I have no reason to believe that there I, I guarantee you there's for every Harvey Weinstein in the movie industry, there there's just as many in the music industry, and they're probably doing the same things. The thing is Harvey Weinstein just got caught. Yeah, he did. And you have a pretty good point. And every once in a while, you'll hear a story, you know, something will break, you know, in, in the press about somebody suing their manager or producer. Well, Kesha. Right. There you go. Yeah. That's who I was thinking of. It's exactly right. I forgot yeah, the name. Kesha and uh, Dr. Luke and that dude's still around. Like he's still producing records for women. And you, you think that these people, they do it one time. 
I know. Oh, oh no, they. And the thing is, these people they're they're wealthy media moguls. So it's not that they are incels, and this is the only way for them to to get any action. It, it is about the power and the dominance. Like I can do this, and I'll get away with it. And the, the dude did. He got away with it. And then I'm sure he went to court. Oh, I'm so sorry that she saw it that way. I've changed my ways and I'm, I, and I'm doing a lot of soul searching. And then when he got off with it, probably, he probably got like five hours community service that would be paid. And it was probably the equivalent of him, like having a picture taken on the side of the road to make it look like he's cleaning up garbage. And then he just starts laughing like, ha ha ha. Like, and nothing bad will ever happen to me. Did that guy even, was he even held accountable? I know he got accused. I don't think I so. I, I mean, I don't remember if that was resolved with some sort of court thing. I mean, sounds like a real horror story, especially if somebody makes those accusations and then they're not, not only might they not be believed, but even if they are believed, then if people aren't supporting them, it goes back to what you were saying about Madonna and Sean Penn. If if the money's behind the uh, of the, the person who did the, was accused of doing the the bad thing, then you've got this horrible uphill battle as as the accuser to say, yeah, they did this, and I want you know, I somebody needs to make this right. But the the sort of deck is stacked against those people. It's it's ugly. It's, well, it's really ugly. Okay, so what can you name Kesha's big single? No, that's at, right outside of my wheelhouse, man. All right, DJ, go. Was it, was it like TikTok or something like that? It was TikTok. Okay, what was her hit after that? Yeah, no idea. Exactly. She didn't have a career <laughs> after the rape accusations. Yeah, yeah which okay, there she, you go. Which I don't, I don't know if, uh, and a lot of these times these people come out and they say like, oh, you know, the all allegations are completely unfounded, but I don't remember this guy actually doing that. I think it, it seemed pretty, pretty damning that he did. And I think he did the whole fake remorseful thing, but she, she was really popular for, for a little window in time, because that, that song came out next to uh, Poker Face and Let's, and Let's Dance. Hmm. So there, that kind of like dance floor girl pop w- was kind of big that year. And Lady Gaga went on to have a big career, and then Kesha didn't. And Kesha's mom, I want to say, was some Hollywood person too. Like she, I want to say that she has roots in that industry. She might've, she might've been a country singer or something. I, I want to say like, she, like she didn't come out of nowhere. She had some kind of connection, but yeah. she, she says, yeah, by the way, this guy, and he produces a lot of people. Yeah. He, he violently raped me and I'm sure he's done it to other people. And then boop, Kesha, you're gone. Yeah. So it seems to be a story as old as like show business itself. So well, in this fatty pile of well, okay, right. So in this pile of books behind me, one of these books somewhere, I'm not going to turn around, is a, a biography of Natalie Wood, who came oh. of age in the 30s and 40s and experienced similar abusive situations, you know, back in the golden age of Hollywood. And it seems like just the way a lot of times you hear these stories and you think nothing's really changed and it must be a very brutal industry from that standpoint i mean maybe it's not all like that and clearly not everybody's a bad actor i mean in the in the, there's plenty of bad actors i would say well, like there's, that. A bad be, actor. there's that but like not everybody's you know going to be evil and horrible not everybody's self. lying there you go but it seems like it goes on all the time and it's music and film and in business you hear about it in business with with ceos and other people with power taking advantage of the people underneath them it's so pretty, the pretty awful yeah, yeah, right. Sure. Wherever. <laughs> All. I mean, think the whole pantheon of wherever there's power. Where there's probably, powerful people, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have people attracted to that. Oh, I can I can leverage this over you and get you to do what I want. It's probably irresistible at that level for a lot of those folks. I don't I don't know. It's not me, so what the heck do I know? You know? Uh, have either of you guys seen the series called Happy? Is okay. I wanna it, say is is that the thing with Jim Carrey? No, it's with Patton Oswalt is like the uh, voice of like this, like no. this, this creature. But that okay, guy, long story. didn't that guy kill his wife? I don't know. No, that. no, no. She, she, I know that story. No, she OD'd accidentally. I, th- on- I thought what happened was he kept giving her pain meds. Like she was like, I'm in pain. And then he gave her way more than she, that was the story that I heard is that he 
like he basically caused her to OD by giving her way more oxy. That was what I heard. That's awful. It, and I hope that's not true. That's what I heard. Cause yeah, well, whatever, but that guy, oh. I, yeah, I'm not a fan. Okay. Well, anyway, that's okay. It, it has Christopher Milani in it. He's Multis- good. Christopher Moltisanti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, the, this, the show essentially is about like this, this guy that has this like, uh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Christopher, Mol- isn't that the law and order guy? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay, exactly. Okay. But he plays like, anyways, it, it's, it's an, an interesting watch, but the premise is kind of interesting because this, this one guy, he like owns everything and he has like this TV show and he's some like singer for kids. But what he does is he gets people to do really messed up stuff and videotapes them and makes them do everything. Like it, it's kind of like, oh, it kind of seems like that's how the world is run. But yeah, it's an interesting parallel where you're like, maybe this is some type of weird, like humiliation por- ritual. Like, yeah, humiliation thing. It's like some pornography for people that in power. Be like, this is how we do things, but let's just make it, you know, uh, some some more money off of it. Yeah, it, it reminds it, me of that uh, Jimmy Savile story on the BBC where he'd host those uh, oh gosh handyman okay. shows or whatever they were like whatever like uh, trading spaces or whatever whatever he was doing over there. But it, you know behind the scenes he was like this dark. He was a child. Monster. He was like the clown from It, basically. Yeah, I mean it was a horrible, wretched. But but like a beloved like you know mainstream entertainer over there who like Cosby like with this dark secret yeah. you're like oh mm-hmm. my oh my and Johnny Rotten was railing into that guy for years for yes. years yeah, no, you're right. yeah you're right you're right he was like he called it like years ago and people were like yeah whatever and, and he ne- yeah and he never stopped doing it and then like people are like oh you bitter washed up rock star no Johnny right. Rotten's cool I like that guy. Right. Right, right. You know, yeah. right. He did call it. That's right. And I, I've actually I've read interviews with uh, the Beatles, Lennon, Ringo. Maybe one of them made a comment off the cuff in an interview about how that guy gave them the creeps back in the '60s. Like there was just something off about him. And you look at pictures and you think, how could you not? How could you have met that guy or interacted with him and not come away going, "There's something off here." Like maybe it was his eyeball rings, you know. But there's something yeah. where you're like, "What do you?" What are you not seeing? But, uh, well, there was that funny Norm Macdonald joke where he's talking about Bill Cosby and he's like, and then you think about what he did. He was a, you know, a doctor. He was like a gynecologist. So what's that? What's that mean? Like that was what he was (laughs) in the Cosby show. And so, yeah, (laughs) and you look at it now. That's as dark as I could think of, like to put your, to have your public image reflect that one yeah and he would write books on parenting and i i mean i was alive in the 80s oh, yeah. i saw this he was like a he was like a quasi you know he was like a he had a leadership he had a leadership vibe to him like here's a role model and a guy who can give you wisdom but he's really just this dark selfish evil guy and it's like oh uh, uh shocking and and the thing is when, when you talk about these these people in these positions where, where people could say, well, uh, money corrupts, or I guess, or money, the root of all evil. But it, it's not so much that people, are, like, they get money and they start doing it. It's generally the people with money can have people do anything for them. And, and the, the reason the people at the top need money is so they can do this. And going back to, like, music narrative is – they can have Metallica sell out for a bunch of money. Yeah. Like, like if so, you know, if someone wants to give DJ and I $25 million, like we will start the Metallica podcast. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I talk about how uh, we'll rate every track on every album, starting with uh, St. Anger, a 10 out of 10, if you want. But that's what these, these people at the top do is they use their money and their power to make sure that their power is never removed because they, they, they don't want to make cheap money. Like it's, it's easier to sell a McDonald's hamburger than a grass fed burger just cause it's just, it's just, it's just cheaper and easier and it's more profitable, yep. but they, they don't want to, to sell you the crappy, the, the crap music, you know, the country rap, because it's cheaper and easier to make. It's just at that point when people aspire to be, to be crappers or TikTok influencers or something like that, 
Well, they're not going to be competing with these people that are at the top. They're not going to be going to Harvard and they're not going to be majoring in business and they're not going to be working their way up the ladder. They're going to be wasting their potential and then they're going to stay at the bottom. They're going to stay poor because the thing is there are people that go viral on TikTok and there are people that become somehow celebrities because of their social media, whatever their, their 60 second videos. But how many people are on TikTok versus how many people have TikToks that are only like 30, 40 views. Yeah. It's probably like 0.0001% of people that make it to the top. Just like music, how many people, how many SoundCloud rappers are out there versus how many rappers are in the top 40? And the amount of rappers in the top 40, there's like more rappers in the top 40 or there's more rappers having their own songs in the top 40 than there are rappers on SoundCloud. It's like three rappers and then 33 of the top 40 hits come from those three alone. Cause it's not like your top 40 where it's like 40 different people. Maybe one person will have two singles or something. It's just, it's the same. It's the same people. Like go, go through anything and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to find this. If you ever do any research into anything, pick a, a, pick something that seems kind of, I don't know, this, this Kennedy assassination seems kind of weird. You're going to go down some rabbit holes and you're going to see the same names coming up. Just like you go like with music, you're going to go down, like, hold on, what's going on with the, like, why is it these bands? And, oh, it, okay, you're going to see the same producers coming up. You're going to see the same people. The, it, the, the, the reality is the world is controlled by like a, sm, like a low, like, I don't know, less than 3% of, of people. And they just use their wealth and their influence to make sure that they go unchallenged. When you control the narrative, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about making money. Because if you keep everyone poor, then you're going to keep all the wealth. So you don't have to make cheap products that, oh, okay, we'll, 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 we'll churn out a hit. Like, um, let, let's say, um, uh, don't steal my sunshine. You don't need to make crappy songs like that. <laughs> Produce it real cheap. Make a quick buck. When you can just keep good stuff away from everybody. And then you can just, and then you keep everyone like glued to Drake and Lady Gaga. And then when Lady Gaga does anything like, Ooh, I like Lady Gaga. Ooh, Lady Gaga tells me to think this. Well, I'm going to think this. Ooh, Drake tells me to think this. Ooh, I'm going to think this. And that that's how you control narrative. You, you use one, your marketing to push these people to the top. And two, you use your control of, of the market to make sure no one hears the alternative. And then three, you put your message in the mouths of those people that you've pushed to the top. And then it just perpetuates the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. They, there's a hopper. And if you control everything that goes into the hopper, then you've got all the outputs covered. I mean, it's basically what you're saying. If you, if you can determine who goes in there to begin with, then you don't really have to worry when it comes out the other side. And if you set the tone for mainstream music culture, because you're a giant corporation and these are all your recording studios and labels, then you basically know what the final message is going to be. And yeah, and you're going to keep things out that, that for whatever reason you don't feel meet whatever criteria you've set. And so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's true. And the thing is with a lot of those rock and roll guys, I think part of it is a, a lot of them did start maturing. And then they did kind of lean towards less harmful behavior. But another thing is a lot of them were just too unpredictable, but like, go back, like, like Dave, Dave Mustaine is, is a very you know con- conservative Christian guy. He was on uh, politically incorrect saying very liberal things like the, these people, they, they change. So you, you can't keep a lot of these people under your thumb and, and you can tell James Hetfield is in hell by, by the, the pressure that's put on him to, to have certain opinions because like Lars Ulrich famously said, Bill Clinton should be the ruler of the world. Cause he's the smartest man on the planet. But James Hetfield 
he moved out of California because he said, well, I don't really like the politics here, which is his way of, of saying that he's not a California guy. And well, which to me, I mean, I don't know James Hetfield or his story, but that could have been a very calculated, I don't want to say manipulative, but if, if you well, think he said it on Joe happen, Rogan, he if you're going to resonate Rogan. with your audience, if your audience is like, yeah, man, move out of California. We don't need those hippies. That could be, I don't mean to be cynical, but maybe even that choice was a, was a mark, was a marketing ploy. I don't know. I, or maybe I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Cause the dude's been in and out of rehab for years for just alcohol abuse. And, and just like, the guy is clearly not happy. What? I mean, you look, you look at the lyrics for the, the newest Metallica album. Like the, the dude is clearly miserable. So he's, he is just, he's living a lie and then he's, he's just struggling with it. Like Lars Ulrich is fine living that lie. Cause Lars Ulrich is, you know, is a little demon goblin himself. <laughs> he's the only, all I can think about with those guys is how they sued people back Napster, in the Napster yeah. era. Napster, yeah. That's all I, when I think of Metallica, it's like one of the first thing that comes to mind, you know, and it should be something more musical, like, oh, they've released this or that groundbreaking album. But all I can think of is, oh, they sued their fans. For file sharing, I'm like, they never should have done that. That was so stupid. Yeah, oh, yeah. And I remember when I first got Napster, the first thing I was told was like, don't download Metallica. That, <laughs> that, right. was, that was that was the doing. first thing that I was told. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I was just going to download the Jerky Boys. All right. Now, <laughs> I, now I know. Yeah, like, and I was and I was genuinely scared. Like, oh crap! If I download Metallica, like I'm going to get arrested. Like, I genuinely thought that. I I was I was scared. And I, I don't know if other Metallica fans thought that, I mean, I wasn't a Metallica fan at the time, you know, not much. I mean, they know. deserve to be paid. Don't get me wrong. You shouldn't just re record an album they and make have enough. not pay for it. Fine. That, I get that argument makes perfect sense. It's intellectual property, but like the bad PR associated with suing your fan base, it's like, well, intellectual property or not, there's some nuance there that the band and their publicity people just missed. It's like, yeah. Let's let's sue these people for downloading our our files and what boardroom meeting were they all sitting in where they all went yeah that's a let's do that that's a good idea nobody's gonna have a problem with that I'm like uh what let's like career suicide man I think that was a Lars Ulrich emotional reaction because he was the guy huh. that did that led that press conference and then he was the one that was mocked for it I mean did you see some kind of monster No 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 uh, Okay well there there was a a, a, a famous cartoon making fun of Metallica and it's, it's like James Hetfield is kind of like a, like a Frankenstein type. <laughs> and then, and Lars Ulrich is like, hey, so like I'm Lars Ulrich from Metallica. And then they're just, and it was them being made fun of for the Napster thing. And then it would like Lars would talk as Lars talks. And then James Hetfield would go beer. Good. Oh, yeah. Fire bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that, that was, it was like a really famous thing. And then they played it at the beginning of some kind of monster. Cause they, they, they got so much ire for that. And, and it was a, it was a time when Metallica, their sales were going up, but like confidence in them was going, it was so bad. And, and that's why I think they made that some kind of monster documentary to try to reinvent them, you know, like res resurrecting Metallica. Like that yeah. was, might as well have been the name of that. In Insane Anger is, it really truly is one of the worst hard rock records of all time. The songs are bad. There's no solos that it has the worst snare sound ever. And Lars Ulrich still defends it. Like basically says, if you don't like it, you're stupid. And, and I, I think that that was his like just emotional knee jerk reaction. How dare these people take money from us? And then they ended up making fun of it perfectly in South park. If people keep downloading music, celebrities will only be doomed to a life of semi-luxury. Right, right. I mean, so, okay, fair enough. Nobody nobody could predict or or did predict exactly how technology would play out, you know, vis-a-vis -vis things like files and file sharing. But it would have been cool if everybody could have taken a deep breath. Even the record companies were suing people who were downloading. So if they could have taken a deep breath and just waited and let everything play out it i mean it all it reshuffled itself but suing people certainly didn't help and you're probably right that whole metallica project was probably a giant pr resurrection which they needed because a lot of their oh, fans yeah. were like Ugh, forget that you know you're going to sue me i'll move on but I, they seem to come through it just fine i mean i don't you, you know opinions 
aside about the music that they produce. They're they're huge. I mean, they're boring, but they're a huge band. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, yeah, huge they're, the, band. they're the biggest hard rock band of all time. There, there yeah. is not a bigger hard rock band. Now, does that mean that they're the best? No. Right. No, right. Craig. It doesn't mean you're the best because you sell the most. It doesn't mean you're more talented. It just means you have the best promotion. And that, that was what they had is that just, they were the right place, right time. Any band they could, what they, what happened with Metallica, they could have done it to Slayer. They could have done it to Testament. They could have done it to Exodus. They could have done it to any band. They just, Metallica was the one that they picked, which is weird because Metallica's first video was one. So it's not Hmm. like they were like, like Megadeth had, had videos, you know, since peace sells. Uh, I think Madhouse was on the first Joe Belladonna record, right? Is it uh, Madhouse? I'm pretty sure it's on Spreading the Disease, which that's 1985. So you know, Anthrax is going back having having videos then. So they could have picked any band that was already getting MTV airplay, but that that was just Metallica was the one that they picked. And I, I, and I don't think it was because someone saw potential in them and any potential. I believe that someone saw in Metallica was probably these guys have the biggest potential in selling out. Well, yeah, it might've been attitudinal, man. They might've, they might've been really amenable as a group to working with a label to modify their sound. What, however they were told. I mean, I don't know how much. How much of that is, you know, that they, they've decided they're going to change their sound to this, that, or the other thing, or how much is the record company saying, you know, w- we think you should probably try something more. They might've been the most cooperative of all of the candidates. I, who knows? Yeah. They probably have as essentially headhunters that would go to the studios. Like, you know, they, like when Megadeth's recording peace cells, they probably go and they're like, okay, these guys are complete junkies. Like there's like, this is a ticking time bomb, you know? Sure. And then they, you know, they, they go to like anthrax and then. Scott Ian's like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'll, I'll be fine no matter what. Or, or just, just seeing these other bands. And then they, then they're just, they see Metallica and they're like, oh yeah, these guys are completely moldable. Like this, this drummer here, he'll do anything for $40,000. This guy, I guarantee you in the right circumstances, probably chump change to that guy, man. Well, well, yeah, but, but doing anything. And I mean, anything, but they're probably like, I guarantee you if the, you know, the chips are down, this guy will sue his own audience. Well, you know, okay, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, we're being facetious there, but yeah, maybe, maybe of all of those bands, I mean, that in record companies are companies and they do send representatives out to go, who are these people that work for us? Are they cool? Are they doing what they're supposed to? Can we count on them? Do we want to sink any money into promoting them in the future? Yeah, it might've just been a business thing. Like, okay, these guys want to play ball. The rest of these guys, whatever, they have personal problems or they don't want to cooperate. So forget it. Was Metallica on Electra Records? That sounds right to me. I have the first one in here somewhere. Because I, I, because I, I'm just trying to think. I'm, I, I feel like Megadeth was on the bigger record label because they were on Capital. Yeah. Because I, I don't know how big Electra was. I know that Electra. Um, well, wasn't Electra was bought out in the early '70s by Warner Brothers. Warner, it was Warner Electra, okay. Warner Electra Asylum was the, was the big conglomerate of the early seventies when Warner brothers gobbled up some of those independent labels. So by the time Metallica came along, that's, that's a pretty big, it's that's a pretty big record. Label. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So Electra's big, uh, um, well, I mean, Warner brothers is pretty, pretty big. The Warner music group is, is infamous for, uh, getting videos taken off of YouTube because they, no one knew what was in their catalog and someone used a song like, Oh, copyright strike video removed. Yeah. But I, I, I just, I always think of capital as being one of the big ones just because of that, how, how iconic that building is. So I, I don't, I really don't know what's, what's bigger, but you, you would think that I, I bet it actually did come down to Megadeth and Metallica. And then just Megadeth were just so strung out on, on everything that they're just like, eh, go with the other guys. Go with the, go with the drunk guys. I mean, Metallica, visually speaking, I can see why a band like that would be elevated to, to such, 
such a level. I mean, visually, I think they they meet the criteria for big rock band. There's Except for four horns. of them. It's easy to tell them apart. They each have a separate visual identity. Maybe not so much the bass players, but the other three guys, you're, they're sort of like, oh, that's the guitar player. Everybody knows the drummer. And then there's the front man, another guitar player. They were very like distinctive looking. Now, I've, offhand, I can only, I can't really think of anybody in Megadeth except for Dave Mustaine. And as far as groups like um, uh, the other one, the, um, we were just talking about them with Joey. What is the name of that band? I'm Anthrax. losing my mind. Anthrax. Thank you, Anthrax. I can't think of what those guys look like either. Or Slayer. I mean, I know what Slayer looks like because I know Slayer a little bit, but Metallica is maybe the most visually distinctive of all of those bands, and that's part of it too because you can you can take that and package it. I don't know. I'm reaching or, there. I might be BS. Or have you been so accustomed to them that you can tell them apart? It's a good point. Yeah. The, might the be, thing I, is, the thing is with Megadeth, you take enough time with them and then you, I mean, I off the top or just not off the top of my head, but like in my mind, I, I, I can picture all of them up until, mm -hmm. um, uh, the world needs a hero because then it starts being a revolving door of members like Mar like Marty Friedman, you know, he's, you know, very Jewish looking rock star. David, Dave Elfson is just the, the other redhead guy. Then Nick Menza, like Nick Menza looks like he kind of looks like a, a professional wrestler to me. I mean, <laughs> sadly he's, he's passed on, but yeah. yeah. I, is he the one that died? Yeah. I think I heard yeah, about that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris Poland. He kind of looks like, um, kind of looks like a science teacher. <laughs> uh, Gar, Gar Samuelson kind of looked like Carrie Von Eric to me, except, you know, not buff, but yeah, Metallica is very distinct, especially like James Hetfield, his, his big lion's mane and his, and his, his handlebar mustache like that. That's a, like, it's a very rock and roll look like Kirk Hammett also looks like X-Pac, but you know, slightly more Asian. <laughs> well, you have that kind of the similarity to Rudy Sarzo almost elevating them after Cliff Burton passed on. They, they mm. kind of got that, like it elevated him to this legacy status where I mean, we still talk about Cliff Burton today. It, I mean, you talk with other people, it wasn't necessarily that he was the best bass player, but he's everyone remembers him, whether you saw him live or not. Well, and I, I think he's very, very, very much like Kurt Cobain Tupac status. Is no one's going to say Cliff Burton is a bad bassist? I mean, Cliff Burton is a very good bassist, but people do talk about him. Like he was the greatest bass player of yeah. all time, but he was like, I mean, he was a better bass player than Lars Ulrich was a drummer, but it's because he died tragically and, and young that it's, he is, he is more, uh, legendary. Yeah. I, I mean, Jason Newstead does not get a a, a fraction of the props that Cliff Burton gets. And Jason Newstead is an excellent bass player. You just wouldn't He's know it. Good. You wouldn't yeah. know it because they turned him off. Uh, and then by the time yeah, he they... was actually on the records, the songs were so crappy and generic that it didn't even matter. Go it find, like... find, go listen to one where they've restored the bass. Go listen to it. It's uh, on YouTube. It's amazing. Uh, His playing is so good. Well, I figured he wouldn't have got the gig unless he was a monster musician to begin with. Now, what they did with him after that's a different story, but you're not going to get into a band that's already moving up like that unless you know exactly what you're doing. It, it's interesting. And when a, when a member dies like that, there's that weird celebrity thing that takes over and they become like exalted. They become this mythical, like this ghost, you know, and it's been going on since buddy Holly where it's all of a sudden this was the most and nothing wrong with buddy. I love buddy, sure. but yeah, you could do it with anyone. Elevated. Yeah. Like you could do it with Stevie Ray Vaughan, who is an extremely great guitar player, but still yeah, like yeah. it's, it's more that I can't see them. So I'm going to pretend that they're better than they are. Uh, sure. Skinner, Randy Rose. Sure. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and Jack on. Kurt Cobain, be, one of Kurt the Cobain. worst songwriters and guitar players of all time. Okay, so this is where I totally agree. I'm not a big grunge guy. I think it's a cheesy little subgenre, and I think it's just guitars 
cranked up and and it's just Pearl. it's just power chords too it's just yeah. power chords yeah. Yeah, I don't like Pearl Jam either, and I'm not a. I I've never heard what was. I mean, back back in the day, so you had Nirvana, you had Guns and Roses, and U2. They were all sort of drifting in, and then Pearl Jam came up. They were sort of drifting in and out of like most exalted band status, and I just never heard. I mean, I I know what's good about Guns and Roses, and I there's a lot of good songs floating around on those out, especially those two Use Your Illusion albums, but I never found Nirvana to be particularly compelling. I didn't think no, the songwriting the song. was very good. Lyrically, the lyrics okay, are nonsense. I didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't understand the the general like. Let's put Kurt on a pedestal as like the voice of a generation. I'm like, if that's the best we've got, yeah, we're in trouble. And then Pearl Jam was sort of like the heir apparent after Cobain died, and I'm like, they're no good either. Like they still don't have any good songs. They've been around like 50 years. Well, and that was what they used to kill metal. They they and and so. Kurt Cobain is it's a, he's especially terrible because one yeah the lyrics mean nothing. He's not yeah. a good singer. His guitar playing is not good. I I don't think people I really I hope so, but I'm pretty sure people acknowledge that he's not a good guitar player, but they pretend that he's this great songwriter, but it's like four chords and and the lyrics literally yeah. mean nothing. He it, it it is the most subversive music and when we and, and when Dum Dum was on our show, he brought up that they were going to <laughs> Seattle to sex traffic girls, and then they happened upon grunge music that was popular there. So it wasn't that they were like, let's find the next big sound. Oh my gosh, have you seen what's happening in Seattle? It's huge. No, they just found something while they were violating poor runaways or girls that they kidnapped, and they just said, oh, we can just use this. And Kurt Cobain was the voice of a generation because the biggest promoters pushed him to the moon. And then now everyone he, no. thinks that the number I'm pretty sure to this day, the number one most played song on MTV is smells like teen spirit. All that. So, so, okay. Yeah. Right. So the legacy of Nirvana is what the Foo Fighters. I mean, that's what we got for our troubles. You know, you take one band that's kind of like, eh, and then they spawn this other band that's even bigger. That's twice as boring. I mean, there's a, there's a spinoff <laughs> band that's bigger than the parent band. They're twice as boring. How does that even work? Uh, well, they, they pushed Nirvana to the moon and then he, and then Kurt Cobain gets killed by Courtney Love. And then they said, well, yeah, right, right. The, the goal, yeah, there's the, that. The, the, there's I the mean, elephant in the room that nobody it's like is anybody going to address that or are we just all going to go oh yeah okay that's uh, no, his wife killed him. exactly yeah. we're going to ignore it but you know the the golden goose stopped laying eggs well we have the guy who was in that band who's still a competent musician so we can do the same thing with him and but they're so boring i mean that's i just that is the the they're a huge rock band they're a huge rock band and i still think uh, you know after how many ever years it's been 30 years they don't have any good songs i feel that way about pearl jam too like okay good for you that you're out there i guess but when i think about the catalog i'm like oh what foo fighter song would i be like oh i wish i could hear a foo fighter song right now and i'm like nothing comes to mind like silence dead silence uh well um i don't know right. uh yeah i know i i don't know a lot of foo fighters Fans. I know a lot of people that say they like them, but they don't like, I've, I don't really, I don't be, see it that often. How can you self-respectingly admit that you're like, oh, I'm a Foo Fighters fan. Like what? <laughs> what Who says that? First of all, and second of all, what does that say about you? Is that really, that's what you are? Like, oh, I love three's company. What a great show. I'm like, don't be stupid, man. Well, do you ever see someone wearing a Foo Fighters t-shirt? No, I was thinking about that. I don't think I've ever seen <laughs> think, anyone yeah, wearing a Foo Fighters so shirt. Either. I see more I bad mean, bunny shirts. That's a crime against humanity. I mean, if you see somebody in a Foo Fighter shirt, it's your duty, it's your it's obligation for a citizen to go, no, <laughs> don't do that. I I would I would <laughs> bet money the same people that are Foo Fighters fans are the same people that are like modern or contemporary Metallica fans. It's sure. it's some guy a, a 55 year old who, who's trying sure. to look hip. Like that, that's probably what it is because, and, and when you say, what does it say about you? I'd say it, it's more a reflection of rock in the, in the current yeah. state that there's just yeah. nothing else. Like in a very early episode, we had, we had a guest and then he brought up Greta Van Fleet as far as a, a modern band that, that like a rock band that's, that's somewhat charting. And I, I stand by that Greta Van Fleet is only popular 
because they are essentially a Led Zeppelin clone. Sure. Like, and and, it, yeah. and, it, and it, it's not like the singer sounds like Robert Plant, but the music is trying to sound like Led Zeppelin. So it is an absolute nostalgia throwback thing. It, 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 it's, it's not like, hey, check out this rock band. It sounds like 70s stadium rock. No, no, no. It's a band that's just trying to sound like Led Zeppelin Led, yeah. Led Zeppelin four particularly. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think they're very conscious of what they're doing there. And anymore uh, that that debut album came out like seven years ago, so they're not even new anymore. Right, they've been yeah. around, but yeah, they still yeah. do. They, they're still aping like Zepp, early Zeppelin. So you know, whatever. All the old people are like, "Oh, this rocks," but I'm like, it's like retread of a retread. You know? Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and we're. And we're so desperate for rock that like, instead of having that, you just have a band that, that's almost a, like a tribute band, not a cover right. band, but like they're right. basically right. A, a tribute band. And, right. You're so and, starved. You're so starved for that sound. You're like, uh, yeah. I'll take these little, what are they? I'll like, take the Foo Fighters. Guys? Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> crank up some Foo Fighters. Uh, man. It's like, well, they play it's guitar. like a, abuse to your ears. It's horrible. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's and and it's it's just because they they don't allow rock in the mainstream that people are just so starved for any kind of a semblance of of edge that they're just like, oh look, yeah, it's 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 not Jelly Roll, <laughs> like, yeah, this rocks, and and the, and the bar it really is it's just that low. Like we we just we have such a, a low bar that people are. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess, I guess I like this stuff. It's like, well, what about those other bands? Well, you can tell it's rock and roll because the guitar player has like a, a like a mean look on his face and his hair's a little long. And you're like, there's your edge. Your edge is like fashion. I, and by the way, I, I don't hate the Foo Fighters as much as, as you do, but I have uh, always found Dave Grohl's stage presence to be so try hard. <laughs> like I, I, I've never seen anyone like go out of their way to look intense. Like the way he chomps his gum is like, like it, it's so obnoxious and, and just how he moves his arms when he plays. I'm like, dude, y this is the phoniest thing I've ever seen. This is more phony than your hair plugs. Like, give me a break. Dude. Uh, it reminds me of Eddie Vedder. Who's another one of those performers who I think he, he, kind of brings, Vedder. he brings like a, 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 a theater sense of d dramatic to to his delivery but if you listen to it like he's not really singing about anything he's just kind of like growling and braying like a goat you're like what what is this what am i and he looks so intense and so his brow is all sweaty and he's like really trying to get something across but like what i have no idea you know and, and to contrast it with another band that was actually good from that era sound garden is that band actually did rock like that was a band oh, yeah. that, that had edge and Chris Cornell could sing and there was, there was edge and there's an attitude. And then the rest of Great those drummer. bands, yeah, the, the only bands from that era that I do like are Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, but oh, Alice, I love Alan. Alice That's in a Chains, band. yeah, yeah. Alice in Chains didn't sound like them. Like Lane Staley kind of sang like Eddie Vedder and like Chris Cornell kind of sang like, like there's yeah. like that, yeah. that, that, that flat that they all they they kind of did that so that's why i think a lot of them were lumped in like that but alice in chains is, is a is a very good band and they ended tragically because you know lane staley's problems but they also famously made fun of metallica on their unplugged recording yeah great band great songwriting and lane staley and jerry cantrell are a great team just like cornell and his guitar player really a, a distinctive team who wrote interesting music and that Soundgarden's guitarist, whose name escapes me, is a really creative player. And those riffs are, they're not like, you know, it's not like super complicated progressive rock riffs, but they're very creative and they're more complicated than they seem. I hear a lot of Zeppelin in Soundgarden, and I, I think, I mean that as a compliment. It's a very, um, a lot of texture in what those guys did. And I just think Alice is great. I think that's a great, sludgy, metally sounding band with a real eye on on the popular side of rock and roll they they still had a real good pop sensibility but as far as grunge the rest no, of those guys are a bunch of hacks but no those particular it, it sucks 
It, it, yeah, grun- grunge sucks. That's why there's not people popping up to make grunge bands like there are metal bands. It, yeah. it's, it, those those bands have no staying power other than like Eddie Pearl Jam has is a, an established name. That that's yeah. all, all it is. Yeah. It, it's a name that was pushed to the moon. And another band that sucks is Stone Temple Pilots. They have one song that I like, but that Scott Weiland sucks. Their songs are boring. Just so that, what did that you era. think of what did you think of Velvet Revolver? That band sucked so much. I thought they were a little disappointing. I thought the songs might be a little bit better given the No, they sucked. They were the thing. most generic rock. More generic. Oh my yeah. god, you could not get more assembly line rock. Yeah, you'd think that they would bring some edge considering who those people are, but oh my gosh, that band and Audio Slave, like two of the most boring oh, bands dude. of all oh. time. Audio Slave, just absolutely boring. And you know, I I heard, and I might have this wrong, but when they were putting Velvet Revolver together, Izzy Stradlin was 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 going to be part of that. And to me, there's where the the songwriting juice from Guns N' Roses was. So had he joined that the Velvet Revolver band, I think they would have had some really great rock and roll. I think Izzy was like the secret sauce in Guns N' Roses. And when he left, that was kind of it. And without him in that band, I mean... I, I don't know if any of the rest of those guys can write because I don't really hear it on the Velvet Revolver. I hear a lot of generic, blowhard, you know, classic, rocky, post grunge. No, that was like dad rock. Like, like, like yeah, it's like Buck Cherry. <laughs> That's what yeah. that band was. It, it's just like, like we don't have rock and roll anymore, so there's nothing to compete with, so we can do whatever we want. But turns out you need to do something that's good to keep an audience but we're 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 at we're at the end so uh, dj why don't you just take us home yeah no uh again thank you vince for for everything and and for hopping on on short nose appreciate it it was long in the making um and you know uh please you know come back anytime and uh where can folks find you and what are you you know what else are you working on or got in the mix what yeah what what am i any you know anytime you guys you guys are a blast i think you have a great show and i certainly enjoyed this conversation we could go and go and go all day long i'm going to continue to work on my show i'm not you know you can go to valencia college radio and find me every friday from 4 to 7 p.m i am on facebook and linkedin and some of the, the older guy social media so i'm findable there too but i think i maintain a fairly low profile but maybe that'll change. Maybe this particular show will springboard me into the upper echelon of highly visible radio content producers, but I doubt it. But anyway, I, I love you guys. I think I would I would do this anytime. So I appreciate the opportunity. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Vince. And, um, you know, we'll close up the show with one of AC's original songs um, off his album Endure, which is Into Lands Unknown from ancestors call and and thank you all for tuning in and this is another episode of the metal podcast and vince and everyone else out there please stay safe out there